the blunt truth is non CO two impacts have been conveniently ignored by the sector for for quite a long time now. We've known about non CO two impacts for decades. Um, the the David Lee paper that came out just a few years ago suggests that it's it's actually two thirds of aviation's overall climate impact. So whilst we're so focused on carbon, we're ignoring two thirds of the problem. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives, technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive. If you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. My guest today is Matt Finch. He leads the UK office for transport and environment, an important and influential group that influences policymakers around Europe and the UK and beyond on climate friendly policies for helping aviation decarbonize in the future. Matt shares a lot of opinions from the previous climate activists we've had, yet he's very rational, having himself come from road transport and seeing what it takes to decarbonize an entire sector. He shares his vision in transport and environment studies on how aviation can decarbonize for a greener future. Matt, welcome to the show. When was the last time you took a flight? It was last summer. I went to my cousin's wedding. Where was that? Uh, it was in the UK, actually. I was in France. You took a flight from France to the UK. That is despicable. I was, yeah, it is. It's, uh, what can I say? It was the south of France. It, it cost a small fortune to get there by train. It was very cheap to get there by plane. Thank you very One much. Of the fundamental problems of air travel and, and rail travel. Or rather the fundamental incentives of air travel and disincentives of modes like trains, which, which do not help drive adoption. And I rest my case where, yes, airlines are blamed, but there aren't that many viable alternatives, are there? It, it, it depends on the route. It depends on where you're going. But absolutely, there are... In the UK, we're sat in London right now. In the UK, the trains here are unbelievably expensive. Um, and that encourages people to fly. Exactly. Flying isn't perfect. We all know that. Mm -hmm. But cost is a major consideration for a lot of people. And, and here's a real life case study. Since I've been living in London, I've done my best to take trains when I can or avoid multiple hop flights, try to fly nonstop to, to save on uh, CO2 emissions. And we, Dirk and I recently were at a conference in Amsterdam and months earlier, I had told Dirk, we are going to take the train. We're going to take the Eurostar. And as it happened, even though the conference dates were certain, our modes of transport weren't certain until the week prior. And when we tried to book the Eurostar, it was 800 pounds for a round trip on the Eurostar to Amsterdam. And it was 80 pounds on EasyJet. Decision made. Mm hmm yeah. I was very disappointed that I could not take the Eurostar, but the train companies are not doing anything to attract people. I mean, 10x the fare. How does this even make sense? I, I, I wish I could. I mean, I can give you a few little reasons. We, could, we can talk about fuel duty now if you want, yeah. straight away. Let's go, let's but, go right into it. So, um, <laughs> so is aviation artificially cheap? Are airfares dramatically suppressed and it's unrealistic? So... You need to look at how all sectors are, are charged for the pollution that they cause, um, fundamentally. And we apply fuel duty, and we do this because of the, what economists call negative externalities. We all know about it. Fuel, f burning fuel causes knock-on effects, knock-on costs to society. And we charge for everyone who burns fuel, apart from airlines. So we charge farmers. We charge workers, commuters, we charge hauliers, we charge rail operating companies. We don't charge airlines. It's this 
there's an unbelievable stat out there. You know, any British driver has paid more fuel duty, more fuel duty last time they filled up than British Airways has ever paid. That's not As fair. As a percentage of revenues or a percentage of fare. No, just in once, in one filler, British Airways has never paid fuel duty, ever. I have. <laughs> I've paid more fuel duty than British Airways. What British about, Airways made £50 a second last year. What about this fuel surcharge I pay when I'm redeeming Avios or, you know, that's always there, isn't it? I have no idea about Avios and fuel, sur- <laughs> fuel surcharges, to be honest. Okay, and I know we are talking about this UK-specific context here, but I do know, for example, in India, jet fuel has a luxury tax on it because it's considered a luxury good. So there, it's one of the highest jet fuel taxes in the world, and yet airlines there are making money. So it's it's perfectly possible to make money and pay fuel taxes, as every single haulier demonstrates so it's like i say it's it's ridiculous that airlines don't pay fuel duty okay why is that the case is that just because there's an airline lobby there's a very good airline lobby yeah for sure um there's it's simple inertia in the system they haven't and so a lot of politicians don't know that they could charge fuel duty um interesting your, your guess is as good as mine, though. I, I would veer towards good lobbying and political inertia, though. Okay. I mean, when we... I'm, fr- I'm from within the aviation industry. When we speak about taxes and charges, many countries claim that aviation is unfairly taxed or charged from landing fee uh, to uh, air passenger departure tax, all of which is collected from aviation passengers and then sent out to other industries, not necessarily there to benefit aviation, let's say, to build sustainable aviation fuel. So supposedly there are ample taxes already on the passenger. So that, that's how tax works, right? We, we tax certain things, and then we spend the money elsewhere. Uh, schools, hospitals, roads, you know, public sector wages, everything is paid for out of tax. So this argument that any tax that, that is paid by the sector has to go back to the sector is, is complete nonsense. Interesting. Let's 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 debate that first a, a bit more, right? So let's bring in sustainability and the the cost of making aviation sustainable. It's five trillion is what we're looking at for aviation to meet its net zero goals, and we have to get creative in order to fund this. And one country, Singapore specifically, recently announced that they will be taxing aviation. They'll be adding a sustainable aviation fuel tax on all flights from 2026. And I think it's 2 to $4 for short-haul flights from Singapore to KL or Bali to up to $12 for a long-haul flight, which sounds amenable to me, but that tax is cordoned off and ring-fenced to be invested in buying SAF and increasing the production of SAF from the Neste facility in Singapore. That sounds like a pretty smart idea to me. Yeah, it's a good idea. So, so let's let's look at the UK and let's think how UK aviation is taxed right now, um, and compare it to then what happens elsewhere. So, l- like I say, the sector as a whole has to pay its contribution, as does every sector. So, some some of the tax that's paid has to be cordoned off for general general spend, schools, hospitals. Some of the tax has to go to the costs of the negative externalities, you know, climate change, air pollution. We're, we're, in, Lo- we're, we're in London on a sunny day. Uh, we've just had a conversation about needing air conditioning units. Um, we will need millions in old people's homes very soon. That is an effect that's been caused by climate change. Climate change happens from burning fossil fuels. Let's tax all all fossil fuels. This isn't an aviation thing. It's let's tax all fossil fuels. Broadly, we do tax all fossil fuels apart from in aviation. So already, all I'm saying is, you know, fair contribution and target the negative externalities, go for the economics approach. And then if if you need a surcharge on top, great, I've, I'm, I'm fine with that. But let's do the first two first. We're not even doing the first two. Okay, and I and I buy your argument, right? If there's a negative externality, let us make sure it is that industry is fairly taxed. What we are talking about is essentially carbon pricing or carbon taxes. I know the UK has a carbon tax in general in the country. Canada has carbon pricing where the polluter pays. It's a polluter pays principle. 
The reality, though, is I believe the statistic is 50% of Brits don't take more than one flight a year. And the other 50% are taking a lot, especially, I think, the top 20%. It's it's even worse than that. So half of Brits don't fly in any given year. Okay. Um, most of the rest fly twice, once to go on a usually a summer holiday, once to come back. It's a, it's it's a, a very trip. small percentage of people that then take more than one flight and amongst that group of people there 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 are then a group that fly very often way over five six seven times a year what's your view on a frequent flyer tax for just these hyper frequent flyers as opposed to a generic carbon tax for everyone my starting point on this like you've heard aviation is undertaxed let's get it to a point where we we acknowledge that aviation is paying roughly the right amount of taxes that it should do. And then let's start targeting specific taxes to do specific things. Frequent flyer levy, levy is a, an elegant solution. It has good points and it has bad points. Fuel duty is another elegant solution, which has pros and which has cons. Interesting. Now, at Transport and Environment, are you looking only at aviation or do you go beyond aviation as well? So we are, we, we badge ourselves as Europe's leading advocate for clean, uh, tr- clean transport. Um, so we cover the whole of transport and we go right into the back end. You know, where's the hydrogen coming from? Where's the electricity coming from? Things like that. Okay. And compared to, let's say, roads and, and cars or automobile industry, areas like shipping and aviation are definitely harder to, de- to decarbonize. How do you balance that? They, they, they absolutely are, yeah. And put the right solution in for the right mode of transport. Um, we are not saying that in road transport, for instance, we should be considering lots of biofuels or lots of hydrogen. We absolutely should not. All cars should be electric and as quickly as possible. That's, Imagine cars running on PTL. Yeah, it, it just doesn't make it doesn't make sense for many, many, many reasons. Um Aviation and shipping are very different modes of transport and have different needs and, and therefore will have different solutions. Okay. One of the solutions for aviation is sustainable aviation fuels. Yep. And the UK government was proactive in announcing a SAF mandate recently. What's your take on that? I was a little bit disappointed with it in the end. So the the UK mandate is very ambitious, very good in the short term, and then drops off quite dramatically. And and the ambition levels post 2035, well, they're not ambitious. Uh, So here's an interesting contrast, right? I would take ambitious short term measures over lukewarm um, short term measures and very strong long term measures. Uh, Give you a case of the US, there's the IRA, which incentivizes airlines and others to develop SAF. And what we're seeing in the US is lots of airlines are taking long term off take agreements, but the actual usage of physical SAF is very little compared to European airlines, which have to comply with mandates in an increasing manner up till 2030. And that drives adoption. So isn't that better? That's that's your opinion. I'd I'd have gone the other way. So, a more ambitious long term approach, i.e., when potential SAF producers, investors think that that whatever product is produced will definitely be needed, provides more incentive. Because remember, you can't just magic up a SAF plant. If you decide you want to get into the SAF business right now, you've got a very good process, you've got feedstock, you know, everything's perfect. It's still going to be, I'd say, six years before the plant is built. And that's quite optimistic. The, uh, the, the vast majority of SAF producers, what we call SAF producers, don't have any plants yet. They're not actually producing any SAF. I think a report I saw recently was there are 18 just 18 producers in the world who are making a drop of SAF or more. And 60% of the global SAF currently comes from Neste and World Energy. So you're right, indeed, very, very specific. Um, I found this interesting. Six years to build the SAF plant sounds realistic, but the mandate kicks in before that. So where are UK airlines going to get their SAF from? 
where are UK fuel suppliers going to get the SAF from is, is the big question. The mandate actually falls on fuel suppliers. Um, the, the short-term answer is it's going to be heifer. Um, heifer made from waste oils, lots of used cooking oil probably in the UK, um, which is problematic. Uh, it's problematic because we don't have that much used cooking oil in the UK. Um, we do produce it. I'm not saying we shouldn't use it. We absolutely should use it. Uh, any we produce, though, at the moment, we do use already in road fuel. So any that we put into jet fuel, we put less into road fuel, and therefore fossil di- more fossil diesel is burned on the roads. That's actually not a great result for the environment. I think you need to have more fish and chips. <laughs> Even if we treble the amount of fish and chips that we all ate, we'd be nowhere near the amount of used cooking oil needed for UK aviation. So what does this mean? Are you going to be barging cooking oil up from China and Malaysia and other places? That's what we do right now already. So the vast majority, it's way over 80% of the used cooking oil used in this country comes from China and Malaysia. Is it truly Um, waste cooking oil? No, not at all. So Malaysia exports about three times the amount of used cooking oil that it could possibly collect from its population. Now, Malaysia is also one of the world's largest producers of palm oil. I'll let you do the maths, but the suspicion is that there is palm oil in the stuff that we call used used cooking oil. Is there some sort of accountability or traceability to the oil that's coming here to the UK? Mm -hmm. There is, but the problem is it's it's a paper trail where it's very easy to commit fraud, essentially. Someone somewhere asks the the question, you know, have you committed fraud? Someone else says, no, sir, definitely not me. But we all know it's happening. Okay. How do we address this? Because, I mean, having gone to Malaysia quite a few times, I know they love their roti prata down there, which has a lot of oil. So they can be waste oil, but it just is bizarre to me that we we would barge up using a ship or a boat waste cooking oil through the sea, burning more fuel mm. just so that we can ma- meet the mandate. It, it doesn't make sense. And, and, it, and it's that point, actually. You, you put it on a boat. Even, even though emissions from maritime per unit of used cooking oil really won't be that much, you'd have to take that past many, many different airports to get to Europe. So... The big environmental question is, why not just use it in the local airport? Um, the, the interesting thing here is actually what's happening in China. So there's probably going to be a Chinese SAF mandate soon. The, the, the talk is it's going to be 5% by 2030. And there are Chinese companies who've said, we will use all, all the used cooking oil we can get from China for the Chinese SAF mandate. That makes perfect sense. What that does do, though, is completely destroy the European biodiesel and potential future heifer plants in Europe. So what happens then? I mean, we are looking at other pathways like alcohol to jet, power to liquid. What are the solutions? Something else has to step up or the mandates don't get fulfilled. Which pathway do you see as the most promising? Is it going to be A to J, PTL? Your guess is as good as mine. One of the things I will say is we don't produce that much waste um, compared to the compared to jet fuel demand. So if you want 100% of jet fuel demand to be to be SAF in the future, the bulk of it will be power to liquid anyway. I personally think let's not focus too much on 2G stuff, although there is some good 2G stuff out there. Um, let's... Let's focus on power to liquid and getting the cost down there. Now, power to liquid is 3G. So I think what you mean is 2G is alcohol to jet and power to liquid is 3G. Right? Yeah. But the cost there is indeed huge, especially when it when you're talking about green hydrogen coming in. How do you balance that? I mean, it is more expensive. Who's it, going to cover that green premium? It is more expensive. It is more expensive than fossil jet fuel now fossil jet fuel without a carbon price right now let's add a carbon price in what one of the things that always amazes me when we're talking about saf is the core question is how do we get the cost of saf down how do we reduce the price differential between fossil jet a and and saf 
no one in the aviation sector ever talks about, let's just put a carbon price on all jet fuel, whatever that looks like, fuel duty or ETS, whatever, it doesn't matter. Well, the interesting thing is if you do put a tax on all jet fuel globally, then given that jet fuel is anywhere from 30 to 40% of an airline's costs, it goes up to, let's say, 2x. It's 60% of cost at that point. And if you don't have a sustainable business model, how can you have a sustainable, environmentally sustainable airline? But remember, you're, you're talking about something that isn't taxed right now and arguably should be taxed. If, if it had been taxed 50 years ago, we wouldn't be having this debate now. It would just be the norm. The same way when we go and fill up our car with petrol, it's just the norm that we pay tax. It's always been the way we appreciate why we pay tax and we might not like paying the tax on it, but we do. It's like farmers do it, rail operators do it. Like I say, everyone else does it apart from the airline industry. It sounds like the end of 20 pound Viz Air flights to Oslo. It, it could well be, yeah. Look, how airlines price their their seats, I've never really worked it out because, you know, the, the 20 quid fare is always sat next to someone who's paid 300 pounds, right? Yes, like us when we would have gone to Amsterdam. Right? Exactly. Um, the UK mandate, of course, is a bit different from the EU mandate. How do the two differ and are there lessons that the UK mandate could have learned from the EU one? For, for sure. So the, the first thing to say is broadly, they're the same. There are a lot, the, the, the percentages are different, some of the, the, the minutiae of the rules are different, but broadly, they are very, very similar to each other. There are two things in the EU mandate, though, that make a lot of sense that I think the UK will regret not applying. So the first of those is the tankering regulation. In the EU, you have to uplift 90% of the fuel needed for that flight to stop tankering. The second is the EU's obligation that if a fuel supplier is short one year, it just has to make up the shortfall the next year. The UK doesn't have to do that. There's a buyout price, so a fuel supplier can just pay to buy out. It does mean that SAF will be prioritised in Europe over the UK, though. Interesting. Let's talk about the tankering bit. Now, not every airport can have SAF, which makes tankering a feasible way to carry SAF. It's really interesting in the UK, though, because we broadly have one big pipeline system. Um, it means that the, the, the tankering regulations that, that we're talking, sorry, the, the European airports that we're talking about, it's, it's slightly different here because the, the fuel, SAF, fossil, whatever it is, goes in at one end of the country and comes out at the other. Um, Heathrow, Gatwick, Stansted, they're, they're all connected to the same pipeline system. And it's all based from the pipeline system that was installed in the UK uh, during the war. So, you, You're right, you're right. That, that big circular pipeline, yeah. uh, World War II. Um, and I think the reason for making that big pipeline was in case one of the runways was destroyed by the enemy, you would still have fuel going to the other. Exactly. And you, and you could still take off. Uh, so, yes, why not use it for the, the sustainable times? Now, being realistic, do you predict that the SAF production in 2030 will meet the mandate and the demand? No, I don't think it will. I think the, the, the previous government, I'll say, because by the time you listen to this, it probably will be the previous government, the, the, the Conservative had, had a stated aim of five plants under construction by 2025. That's got very little chance of happening. It, it always had very little chance of happening. It was, How close are we to that? There's none under construction right now. None. Are there any other drawing board? I believe there are four on the or six. Yeah, on the oh yeah. There's, board. there's, there's, there's. Like I say, there's, there's companies that exist. They've got a, 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 a something, a way of turning something into jet fuel. Um, some are more advanced than others, but none of them have a plant. None of them have a plant that's under construction. Most of them don't even own the land that they're planning to put a plant on to to build it. So. I, you know, the, the, the 2025 aim was always marketing, really. I suspect there'll be five plants either under construction or operating by 2030. And will that fulfill the mandate? 
Your guess is because of mine. <laughs> okay. Does, it's, you it's you tempt- don't sound very optimistic. <laughs> well, it's the, it's the Chinese mandate. So I, I could have seen it being filled with heifer, but as soon as China announced that essentially used cooking oil was going to stay in China, um, mm. my pessimism rose. Look, look when, it, when it comes to SAF plants, SAF plants are like any other factory that's ever existed in the whole world ever. They need a good source of raw materials they need a a, you know funky value add process that turns it into a finished product and then they need someone to buy that finished product saf producers right now can't guarantee their feedstocks they might have a good way of turning it into something but it's never been tested at scale and there's no legally binding offtake agreements there's lots of memorandums of understanding but they don't really count for anything you're right. I think what we need is certificate of orders, which which are a bit more legitimate than MOUs or LOIs, letters yeah. of intent. Um, what are views on non-SAF pathways? So let's look at hydrogen aircraft, electric aircraft. Do you believe, one, these will play a role in decarbonizing aviation? And second, do we have the right policies in place to encourage the production of these planes? So firstly, yes, they they absolutely will play a role. And actually, this this is where you can get a bit hamstrung by the mid-century Paris Agreement 2050 target because pretty much everyone I speak to suspects that by, let's say, 2100, we will only be flying in hydrogen planes or electric planes. It's a case of when and not if. Now, the question is how much climate damage will be caused by the aviation sector whilst we get to that that you know utopia that end state um and can we implement policies that that pull that that date forward preferably by 20 30 years so the, and the answer there is yes we can it just needs government will to do that which there are government there is government support out there um there aren't any policies that would guarantee airlines to 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 have to fly zero emission planes what what's happening in the uk right now is the the ati the aerospace technology Institute, that's well funded that's got three or four billion pounds from government it's looking at all the technical problems with these planes but what's going to happen at the end of this process is we have a lovely shiny new plane and lots of airlines who go well i've still got these planes the hydrocarbon burning planes and I don't really want to spend any money on that. Thank you very much. Why wouldn't they if, one, SAF is expensive or there's carbon pricing on jet fuel and you can fly electric, which reuses no fuel, or hydrogen, hopefully post-2050 is cheap enough? It's just the operating lifetimes of planes. They're around for 30, 35 years. Uh, you you'll know this i know this globally there's about 23000 commercial jets flying around there's 15000 on the order books for airbus and boeing alone and they're confirmed orders all of these will be produced probably all of these will burn hydrocarbons and the the climate impact of aviation will just go up and up and up it it, it will get to a point it won't matter what we can do with SAF, what we can do with um, zero emission aircraft, just because there's so many of these planes flying around. So the the stat you need to keep in mind, the aviation sector is growing by about 3% per year. And that that doesn't sound like a lot, does it? 3% 3 is a small number, right? It it takes 23 years of 3% growth to double in size. And that's before 2050. That's before all our target. Yeah, that's before our, our climate target end. So we're not talking about the size of the problem now. We're talking about double the size of the problem that we've got to solve. Exactly. And one of the statistics we release in our book, uh, Sustainability in the Air, is if aviation emission continue to grow, then as a percentage of global emissions, they will rise from about 3% now to 20 three percent in 2050 and when you are a quarter of global emissions then you have got a existential issue and we want to avoid that and that's why we are talking about these multiple solutions from SAF for the existing planes to hydrogen and electric aircraft coming in operational efficiencies that can be achieved today which of these pathways do you think is 
going to have the biggest impact in reducing emissions? Look, all, all, all are needed, right? Uh, the problem is all are needed and the pace we are going at all of them is glacially slow. And whilst this pace continues and whilst arguably you can say that the the aviation sector isn't doing enough and actually the, all the talk about SAF at the moment is is almost misdirection because what we are seeing are these huge num- huge airlines on order. You know, In this country we've got whiz with... 300 new planes ordered. Wizz's fleet is only 200. It's big at the moment, but they've ordered 300. That's 30 billion quid's worth of orders that have gone in. EasyJet's 150. Ryanair's 300. The huge orders that have gone in that will only cause climate damage over the next 20 odd years or so. And it's going to take 20 years for us to really scale up SAF and really get an actual zero emission aircraft that could carry 50 people ready. Given these orders, though, we see airlines are going to grow. Demand management as a tool is out of the window, isn't it? Well, it depends how you define demand management. So you could you could just artificially cap numbers. Shippol's tried to do that. You know, didn't work. Didn't, didn't work. It didn't work because all the airlines that claim to be real sustainability pioneers jumped up and down and said, no, 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 we, we need to fly more. So you really have to question their uh, their honesty there. Um, we could do that, though. We we could apply carbon pricing. We we could do all the easy measures that have happened in every other sector. We could apply them to aviation, and that would probably reduce the growth of emissions. So, interestingly, Lufthansa recently introduced an environmental surcharge, not just as part of a green fare category that they had, but across all tickets. Anyone flying Lufthansa from June 2024 onwards, uh, booking a ticket and flying from 2025 onwards, will pay this environmental surcharge. They have clearly come out to say that this is to cover the cost of refuel EU and other mandates. And yes, it increases the cost of the ticket by a bit. Yes, it means flying Turkish or even Air France KLM right now via Paris or Amsterdam may be cheaper. Uh, But I give them credit for giving it a shot and including this in the pricing. Do, do you know what? I'd, I'd love to see the methodology behind how they work out how much they're going to charge each ticket. Um, the reason I say this is because this has actually already happened in the maritime sector. So shipping companies charged their customers uh, an a EU ETS surcharge. Because shipping came into the EU ETS, they said, look, we're going to charge you a little bit extra to cover these additional costs that we've got. Now, t and crunched the numbers. It turns out the maritime sector were making a massive profit on this. I haven't seen Lufthansa's methodology. I haven't seen how much they're going to invest in SAF. I can't say that there's, they're going to make profit off it for sure, but let's check the numbers first. What if Lufthansa commits to ring fencing these funds? towards sustainability issues. So regardless of how much money they're making, what if they cordon it off for SAF or electric aircraft development or something else? They, they could do that. But again, let's let's look at other sectors out there right now. So do VW do this? No, actually, VW has R&D into electric cars and Anyone who buys one of their cars, you know, a small percentage of that goes into R&D for for future cars. A a percentage of it goes to labor costs. A percentage of it goes to building costs. You know, we don't break ticket prices down for everything. So why should we suddenly start doing it for SAF? This is something that the industry has to do, like every other sector out there has to do and is doing. It's just the aviation sector is doing it quite slowly. And I think this is... This is indeed a good question that you bring up, right? This is as much posturing on Lufthansa's point uh, from from Lufthansa as it is reality because they want to showcase, hey, we are doing this because one, we are forced to, and second, because we care about the environment. So we're going to invest in sustainability. So I think it's twofold. I'm not sure if it needs to be broken down, like you say. Um, It's going to multiple causes anyway. Insetting is how airlines like to position it these days. Uh, I find it encouraging that the charge is there. I do not think it is high enough that it will differ flyers uh, to other airlines. And what I would have loved to see is complete transparency on how Lufthansa is going to ring fence this 
towards sustainable uh, goals. Yeah. Hey, hey. um, let's talk about airports a little bit. Every flight starts and ends at an airport. And you've called for ending airport expansion in the UK. Now, this is significant. What alternative is there for all these, you know, 300, 400 additional planes from Ryanair, EasyJet and Viz, for example? To and, fly to. And, and there you go. The, the alternative is that the, the, the sector doesn't grow quite as quickly as it wants to grow. That's, <laughs> we're we're going to keep on coming back to this point. And therefore, emissions don't grow quite as quickly as they would have done under the counterfactual of all these hundreds of extra planes needing space and flying around between airports. Um, it's, it's funny because UK airport, most, I would say most UK airports at the moment are trying to expand somehow. It might not be the runway, but they, they, there are there are you know, planning permission has gone in for various things. And this year we're going to hear about City Airport, we're going to hear about Gatwick, and we're going to hear about Luton. All of which will mean that there are more flights with bigger planes taking off, all of which means more emissions. Do you know what? I'm completely relaxed if airports expanded and they were only allowed to fly zero emission planes with that expansion. That would perfectly fine to me, uh, except we know that's not going to be the case and we know that emissions are going to go up. I think that's an interesting policy question, right? Can you, say, approve a conditional expansion of an airport saying you can expand as long as every new flight flies in on the mandated amount of SAF or every new flight is electric or hydrogen so there is no net increase in emissions from that expansion? Yeah, there's, there's, you need to look out for the creative accounting. So if, <laughs> if suddenly all the additional flights fly and SAF and none of the previous ones do, you know, that's very creative accounting. But, but for sure, there are no commercial hydrogen or electric aircraft flights right now. So let's, let's boost that market. Let's put this rule in, which would in itself aid the development of that market. I think there are a few uh, Dutch airports that are sort of experimentally leading the path in this from uh, Rotterdam Hague Airport to, um, I think it was Maastricht, uh, that are trying to do electric flights, SAF flights, hydrogen flights, the, the world's first, or trying to operate and trying to lead the way, which it, is encouraging. It, it will happen. And, and actually, it's, uh, I, there are lots of things wrong with the Jet Zero strategy, in the UK's Jet Zero strategy. But one of the things that it did commit to was having a zero emission route in place by 2030. And, and that's a good commitment. That's very much, let's, let's learn by doing. Let's choose two airports in the UK, work out what the plane's going to be that flies between them, work out all the technical problems that are needed. If it's a hydrogen fuel cell plane, how do we get the hydrogen to the airport? How do we store it at the airport? How do we get it from the storage tank or whatever it is into the plane? What problems do we have with the plane? How do we do it all again at the other end? How does it affect the customer experience? There's lots of things that we would learn by just going, do you know what? Let's just do it. So what needs to be done for this to become a reality? Have two airports raised their hands or have they been nominated by the government? Is there an airline in play here? I haven't heard anything like that at all. I have had conversations about it, but this would take... The next government, which is probably going to be Labour, to say, right, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to sit down with airports. We're going to choose two airports. It's probably going to be two airports that volunteer. It's probably going to be an airline like Logan Air, I would suggest. Um, may well involve a Scottish airport then. Uh, if I was going to do it, I'd do it between Southampton and Glasgow, which is the... Yeah, the, the longest. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the route that has the most turboprop flights. Mm-hmm. So, how about Inverness, further north? <laughs> well, it just it, it doesn't it doesn't particularly matter which two airports. It's all about learning. So, mm-hmm. um, and we will learn a lot. And actually, in terms of industrial strategy for the UK, this would be a very good thing because this would attract lots of companies, lots of businesses, lots of inward investment that would go, okay, this country's serious about it. We think we've got something we can offer into this value chain. Absolutely. And I think this is akin to Air New Zealand's flight NZ0, in which they are partnering with the likes of Christchurch Airport, Queensland Airport, 
Yeah. Sorry, Queenstown Airport. Yeah. Queensland is in <laughs> Australia. Sorry, wrong country. Queenstown Airport. Uh, and everyone is raising their hands to operate the first hydrogen flight, first electric flight. And I think this may be akin to the Virgin Atlantic 100% SAF flight, but different and domestically. UK. I would love to see a flight from Glasgow to, let's say, Bristol on uh, a Logan airplane, for example. Yeah. What exactly. about uh, non-CO2 effects? We've not touched those. Uh, do you have a stand on those? Uh, we do. And the blunt truth is non-CO2 impacts have been conveniently ignored by the sector for, for quite a long time now. We've known about non-CO2 impacts for decades. Um, the, the David Lee paper that came out just a few years ago suggests that it's it's actually two thirds of aviation's overall climate impact. So whilst we're so focused on carbon, we're ignoring two thirds of the problem. You know, it's it's the distraction technique again. Let's focus on carbon because oh, these other things they're quite hard and and we might have to do something about them. Interesting. I was having a chat with a senior airline executive, and right next to me was a scientist from the Royal Society, and we were talking about non CO two specifically contrails. And the scientists asked the airline executive, so, you know, what are you waiting for? And the airline exec said, we are waiting for scientists to reach consensus. And we all laughed because I don't think scientists ever reach consensus. Well, and, and when you look at the, the research they put out, they always put out things that say there's, there's a margin of error here. And, and that very same paper had a margin of error for carbon impact. Um, the, the point on this is that the... The margin of error bars mean that the, the climate impact is either huge or absolutely massive. Right? The, there is no error that says, actually, this is a good thing. This is either very bad or very, very, very bad. So it's somewhere in there. Let's crack on and do something about it. Time to take action. What gives you the most hope about the future of sustainable aviation? This is probably a bit of a left field answer for you. I've worked on road transport for much longer than I've worked on aviation. And a lot of the discussions we're having now in aviation, we had it about 20 years ago in road. So we, should we decarbonize the fuel? What's the best feedstock for biodiesel? And what are the knock-on effects? Could we go electric or should we go hydrogen? We, we, sort of, we had all of these things and they've all taken place and we've worked through all of the conversations, come up with the answers and, and in road... Clearly, it's going to be electric. So my optimism comes from the fact that we think it's really hard now, but we actually managed to do it. And it's still a tough task, don't get me wrong, but it's possible. Where I think there could be a problem is if aviation talks itself into saying it's too hard to do. Everett, you started it in this, right at the beginning of this conversation. We started off by going, aviation, oh, it's really hard to decarbonize. It set it frames every single conversation. Instead, let's start by going, we've got to decarbonize. Let's crack on and work out exactly what to do. I'm fully with you. I think the industry is cracking on, and I think perspectives from organizations like transport and environment definitely challenge us as an industry and I think push us forward. I think push the right people forward to say, you know what, let's address these concerns because some, some of them are actually very valid. Uh, and some of the decisions that are going to have to be made, they're tough. Airlines, airports, fuel supplies aren't going to like some of them. Let's, let's be blunt here. But it was the same thing for road transport 20 years ago. Well, I'm, I'm positive that aviation will not take as long as 20 years to take action and get to where road transport is I'll, today. I'll take a bet on with you with that. I suspect <laughs> it'll be more than 20 years. Okay. Well, to start taking action, I think we'll be quicker. I to, take take, to take an action, yeah. To, the action is starting right now, but to get there, yeah, yeah. more than 20 years. Okay. Well, I think Globally, the, that is. Globally, yes. There's going to be huge disparities, but I think if the likes of the UK can lead with this, you know, the first not non um, polluting flight by 2030. The, the UK should absolutely be a leader in this. When when you look at the stats of UK aerospace, i.e. the manufacturer of planes, we, we make all the wings for Airbus in North Wales. Like we're, we're really good at the engineering stuff around this. Um, 
we we have lots of scientific you know very very good scientific research institutes in this country we we should be leading on this both because of our previous climate impacts and because of the massive industrial strategy opportunity that's there oh yes absolutely and i see uh, hope in the work coming out of the Whittle lab at cambridge or what's happening at imperial for example yeah. uh, or even the work that's happening in bristol or around in and around the airbus factory making all these wings for example yeah so i think that definitely gives me hope now the final part of this interview is where we get to know Matt a bit personally. So, Matt, what's your favorite airline? Favorite airline? So, I was, I'm going to have to go with EcoJet. The uh, airline that is yet Dale, to exist. Dale Vince's airline that doesn't exist yet. Well, I was, I, you, you kindly provided me these questions before. My initial thought was Eurostar. But no, I'm going <laughs> to go with EcoJet because okay. they've got a stated aim for zero emission aircraft. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I love their mission as well. And I love the noise that... Dale's making. I hope he, it sees the light of day. Favorite airport? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. The, the, the airports just aren't pleasant places for me. <laughs> Go and sit there for two hours and then get squeezed onto a metal tube. Oh, uh, no. It's the destination that's important when you're flying, oh, not the actual flying bit. I'm missing the romance of flying there. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favorite book? Uh, that's a book called McCarthy's Bar by a travel journalist called Pete McCarthy. And it's brilliant. It's laugh out loud funny. It's about a guy, Pete, McGar Pete McCarthy, who travels around Ireland. And every time he sees a bar with his name on it, he has to go in and have a pint. Simple as that. It's wow. Brilliant. I love it. I wish I had that common a name. <laughs> <laughs> Not getting there. Um, your favorite movie? Star Wars. Okay. Loved e it when I was a kid. Still love it now. The, the originals, obviously. Yeah, easy win. Uh, what do you do in your free time, Matt? I do lots of sports, do a fair bit of cycling now. I'm, I'm a bit older. I used to do football, rugby, basketball, but no, age is catching up with me. So cycling is my main thing now. Okay, easy on the knees there. Um, what is something you'd like to learn? I would like to be better at poker. Okay. I play a bit of poker. I generally lose money. That's my other hobby, losing money at poker. Maybe next time we meet, we hopefully I'll be better. Yeah, let's let's play a game of poker, and I'll call the simplifying team, and we can all <laughs> do a game together with transport and environment and simplifying side by side. And whoever wins goes to a McCarthy bar and buys the other guys drinks. Sounds perfect to me. <laughs> um, what is the best advice you've received? So, not so much advice, but the best quote I've ever seen, and this is relevant to absolutely anyone who works in the NGO sector anywhere at all. And it, it came from a lady called Margaret Mead. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I think it should be written up in, in here for the Simply Flying team. I think it should be written up alongside every sustainable manager's desk to, to just give you that little drive, a little impetus. A wow, bit of that, enthusiasm every day. That sends a shiver down my spine because I think that's what we stand for as well at Simply Flying. We're a, we've, we're a small team. We've always been a very global, small, agile team. And I truly believe we are making an impact because here is, for example, this podcast. It's a platform that is heard by the top airline CEOs, top airport CEOs, top technology CEOs. And it's not like these messages are falling on deaf ears. So... And you know, I can back that up. I, I think I think there's 11 people in the T and E aviation team. Uh, that's it. All yeah, the work we, we do just comes from size. 11 of us. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Well, continue challenging the industry. We will. And I do hope that this podcast makes everyone think on what they can do today, tomorrow, and the day after. I hope so. In getting aviation to net zero. Sounds Thank you, good. Matt. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries, yet there are multiple paths to get to net zero. Awareness is key to a green future. So please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp. Or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at 
simplifying that's simply with an i.com and for more content on sustainable aviation please visit our website green.simplifying.com and join the movement sustainability in the air is an original podcast by simplifying the show is produced by Uri Toth in Slovakia Dirk Singer is our director of sustainability who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich UK Shubhadeep Pal is our supervising editor based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India and Meera Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore and I'm Shashank Nigam. the ceo of simplifying and your host please feel free to connect with me on linkedin